The epistle for this 11th Sunday after Pentecost is taken from St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 15. Brethren, I recall to your minds the gospel that I preached to you, which also you received, wherein also you stand, through which also you are being saved, if you hold it fast, as I preached it to you, unless you have believed no purpose. For I delivered to you, first of all, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, and after that to the eleven. Then he was seen by more than five hundred brethren at one time, many of whom are with us still, but some have fallen asleep. After that he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. And last of all, as by one born out of due time, he was seen also by me. For I am the least of the apostles, and am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace in me has not been fruitless. Please stand for the gospel. The gospel is taken from the seventh chapter of the Gospel of St. Mark. At that time, Jesus, departing from the district of Tyre, came by way of Sidon to the Sea of Galilee through the midst of the district of Decapolis. And they brought to him one deaf and dumb and entreated him to lay his hand upon him. And taking him aside from the crowd, he put his fingers into the man's ears and spitting, he touched his tongue. And looking up to heven, he sighed and said to him, Epheta, which is, be thou opened. And his ears were at once opened and the bond of his tongue was loosed and he began to speak correctly and he charged them to tell no one, but the more he charged them, so much the more did they continue to publish it. And so much the more did they wonder, saying, He has done all things well. He has made both the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak. Please be seated. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. My dear faithful, there was once a girl named Helen who grew up in Alabama on a southern plantation. And when she was a year and a half old, she developed uh, the disease of scarlet fever. And it was a terrible case of scarlet fever. And while Helen survived the disease, yet it left her terribly disabled. It took away her sight. It took away her hearing. And consequently, it also took away her ability to speak because she could no longer hear the sounds of the English language. And so from that point, her parents had in, her, in their home a child with whom they really could not communicate, or if they could communicate, it would only be at a basic level. They, they could speak to their child, but the child would not hear them. They could make motions to the child, but the child would not see them. And the, the best they could do is, is just see what, whatever the child was doing and try to figure out somehow what was going on in the mind of the child? What, what were the needs of the child? And as the years went on, um, Helen would sort of develop certain ways she could communicate to her parents and, and let them know what she needed. She developed like 60 different signs to say to them, I, I'm, I'm thirsty or, or I'm hungry or I'm tired or things like this. But still, with just 60 signs, the, the communication was, was at a very, very basic level. And at some point, her parents decided that they would hire somebody who was an expert in dealing with children who were both blind and deaf. And this woman who they hired, her name was Ann Sullivan, she herself suffered from blindness. She was not completely blind, but she was mostly blind. And they brought this teacher in to live with them to help their poor daughter. And the first thing that Ann Sullivan did when she came to help this child, whose name you probably know is not just Helen, but Helen Keller, is she gave to Helen a doll. And she took her hand, grabbed her hand, and traced the letter, the letters D-O-L-L, -L, in her hand while she had the doll. And Ann Sullivan would do this with, with everything. She would make the child have physical contact with some object and then trace the letters, the, the spelling, 
of that thing in her hand. And Helen was just, just not getting it. And she even became a bit frustrated with her teacher doing this to her all the time. And there was one time when um, gave, she gave to Helen a mug and, and traced the letters M-U-G. And Helen just got upset. And, and she, she took her doll and threw it and, and broke her doll. It was, it was the, back in the day when, when dolls were not made out of plastic or rubber, but uh, they were made out of porcelain or some, some uh, fragile material. But there was one day when, when finally uh, Miss Sullivan, through, through her perseverance, through her persevering teaching, was able to bring home to Helen what she was trying to do. It was a, a, that, that moment of epiphany was when she poured some water. She had a faucet of water, and the water was pouring on her hand. And in the other hand, she traced the letters water. And as that, as that moment, at Helen clicked, oh, now I understand. What my teacher is doing in my hand is a representation of this physical object that I'm feeling in the other hand. And from that point, it's as if her, her mind was awakened, her mind was opened, and she desired so much to learn. And for everything that she touched from then on, she would, she would ask her teacher, you know, no, not, maybe not uh, with, with her voice, but, but grab her teacher, you know, and ask her for how you spell that thing. That, that method was a bridge between her and the reality that seemed so distant up to that point. You probably know that after this moment, Helen Keller went on to actually develop the ability to speak. To, to read. She, she was able to read through, through Braille. She was able to learn the meanings of words. Um, and to read, to give speeches, to have an, even an academic career until she, she died at the ripe old age of 87. And the reason why I bring her up today is because she is a picture of us in the supernatural order. We are like Helen Keller in the supernatural order, when it comes to divine things. We're like that man in the gospel today who cannot speak, um, who cannot hear. Naturally speaking, we cannot see divine things. We cannot hear divine things. We cannot speak divine things. And there's a couple of reasons for this. The first reason is, is that it's just not according to our nature. Our, uh, our, our human nature is limited to the natural order by, by definition. By definition, we are not able to attain supernatural things because we are natural beings. You know that if you went out into the prairie and, and you saw an antelope there and you saw a prairie dog there, um, you, you would not say to yourself, I wonder if, if this prairie dog is capable of rational conversation. Um, should, I, should I address Mr. Prairie Dog and, and ask him if he's having a good day? You never ask yourself that because you know automatically that this is beyond the capacity of any prairie dog to think and to have rational discourse. It's not within the powers of prairie dogs to do that. So you're never even going to try. That's how it is for us as human beings. It's not within our power to do divine things. We are not God. We are creatures. And so, as a result, we are blind and deaf and mute, naturally speaking, in the supernatural order. The other reason why, why this is the case is because of the fact that not only do we have an, a creaturely nature, a human nature, a non-divine nature, but we also have a nature that is fallen that is terribly fallen, that we receive from our first parents. Our first parents pass on original sin to us, and this original sin gives us an inclination away from the good, away from what is right, and towards sin and evil. And God is, is what is good and holy. Sin and evil is, is what is totally contrary to God. So we are kind of pointed away from the supernatural order. We're not, we're not just sort of neutral with regards to the supernatural order. We're pointed away from the supernatural order by our fallen nature. And, 
you know, when we, when we hear the story of, of Helen Keller or uh, we, we read this story today in the gospel of, of our Lord curing this man in, in this um, extraordinary fashion, we, we are very much consoled. Because when we see someone who is disabled, when we see someone who does not have the normal powers that we have and we enjoy in our life, just think of the, of the power of sight to see all that we see or the power of hearing, where you can, you can hear a beautiful piece of music and enjoy a beautiful piece of music. Or the power of speech, where you can have a conversation with someone. You can talk about um, things that are sublime, things, things that are mundane or whatever, but just, just to have the power to communicate, to express yourself. What wonderful powers these are that God has given us. There's something even quasi-miraculous about them. Of course, they're in the part of the normal natural order, but... But they're incredible things. They're really incredible things. And when we come across people who do not have these gifts, even just one of these gifts, we are struck with sympathy. We say, wouldn't it wouldn't be wonderful to be able to communicate to this person this power that I have that, that makes my life so much richer. When we were walking yesterday um, in Denver on our pilgrimage, at a certain point, we were on a sidewalk and, and we came across a blind man. And it, it, it struck me that it immediately, you know, we need to get out of, out of his way. I don't want our pilgrims to run in to this blind man because he can't see us. And I had to say to everybody, you know, everybody, we, we need to get to the right because there's this blind man there. And he was there with his stick trying to find his way and did not know there were 200 people coming his way because he couldn't see. So this is something that that consoles us so much when we are able to see someone who has severe disabilities being given the powers that we have naturally and this is why our lord came down on this earth he came down to take away our supernatural disability he came to make us capable of doing divine things in the supernatural order. And you know, in the, this is why <clears throat> the church, in the midst of the ceremony of baptism, she has the priest do something that's very hygienically incorrect, but, but it's done by our Lord. So, so she, she has the priest repeat what our Lord does in the gospel today. The priest takes his own saliva, and he, he, he marks the ears and the nose of the child and says, et feta, be opened. Because what happens in baptism, it's like, it's like the, the supernatural senses are now open. The soul before is dead. And then, and then the soul is unblocked and divine things can go in to the soul. And so the, the priest anoints the ears and it's a symbol of the ears being unblocked. Now the child can sense divine things. The soul is lifted to a new level once the waters of baptism are poured and is capable of seeing God, hearing God, speaking to God, praying to God. Baptism makes us capable of doing things in the supernatural order. It takes away our supernatural disability, and this is a wonderful thing. It is an amazing thing. It is a thing that, that we, we must cherish just as much as if, if we saw. I mean, when you go to a baptism, we must cherish that just as much as if, if your, your child was, was born blind, you know, and, and the priest came and, and gave to your child's sight. How happy would you be? But you must be just as happy when your child is given supernatural life, your child is made capable in the supernatural order. One thing that is different between the natural order and the supernatural order is the fact that, that once we are made capable of divine things in baptism, we can still lose that capability. We can fall into mortal sin. And when we fall into mortal sin, we can no longer sort of perform supernatural acts. It's not that way in the, in the natural order where we can hear sometimes and can't hear at other times. But in the supernatural order, if, unfortunately, if we fall into, into mortal sin, we are made dead. We are, we are not 
no longer capable of doing supernatural acts that make us merit heaven. That's one of the reasons why it's so important for us to maintain ourselves in the state of grace. But generally speaking, all of us must seek to um, stimulate our supernatural life. We must realize that our soul has a life. It has a divine life that, that needs to be nourished. There are, there are like, as it were, spiritual senses that have to be activated, that have to be exercised. Um, parents especially should, should realize that their children are born into this world without supernatural capacities. It doesn't happen naturally that, that your children want to do divine things, that your children want to do supernatural things. You know, as our, as our world become, becomes more and more paganized, people are less and less attuned to the things of God. They, they just, the things of God become more and more foreign to them because fewer and fewer parents are giving to their children a sense of the things of God. And it's a tragedy for those, those children. The children growing up today, so many of them are completely disabled in the supernatural order. They have no sense of things divine. What a beautiful thing it is for, for Catholic parents to, to have this sense of, of their duty before God and to create a home in, in which there is this environment of the things of God, where, where the children develop as sort of a second nature, the ability to pray, uh, the ability to uh, have recourse to the saints, to, to, to learn the lives of the saints. You know, there's so many beautiful stories about especially the mothers of saints. Mothers have this gift of working with their, with their young children and giving them this sense of the things of God when their children are most uh, malleable, most willing to, to hear these things. Uh, you think of the parents of St. Therese, the little flower. You think of the parents of Archbishop Lefebvre, the, the, the mother of, of St. John Bosco, the mother of Pope, Pope St. Pius X. Now, the, these, are the, these are the great models for for mothers in, in their instruction, their communication of divine things to their children, the opening of the senses, uh, the supernatural senses of their children to the things of God. Or the beauty of a home where the sacred heart has been enthroned. And, the, and that enthronement that, that Father Brueggemann was speaking about yesterday is taken seriously. And the, and the parents really strive to create a home um, where there is a sense of religion, not, not smothering the, the children, and it, it can be a delicate balance, but, but really uh, making it more something of a second nature, not, not, not something that that's, uh, is just so oppressive that, that the children become... Um, just overwhelmed with it over time, and it's burden, very burdensome for them, but it's just part of life. It's just part of life. <clears throat> Even, I mean, if we, whether, whether or not we, we were blessed with, with such a home um, growing up, um, the fact is that, that as adults, we, we, we have just as much a need to, to, as it were, stimulate and exercise our spiritual senses. Um, if, if we do not do that, Again, we go back to our natural state, or we go back to our natural pagan state if, if we are not continually feeding our soul with these spiritual things. It can be interesting to, um, when, we, when we go on a, a, a retreat or, or a pilgrimage, and our spiritual senses are, are very much stimulated in those contexts to, to see, to try to to try to get in touch with our soul. See, what, what impact is this having on my soul? Those are the times when you especially have a sense of the supernatural order much more than at other times. Our default state is where we take so much effort to um, come in contact with the things of God. But if, if, we, if we go on, on a really uh, spiritually intense experience like a retreat or a pilgrimage, and then we go back home to our normal life, we, we feel like we're, we're different, and the, the, supernatural, the supernatural seems so much closer, uh, and perhaps, you know, we go, we go to turn back on this, this piece of pop music that, that we like, and we're just like, not so interested in that, or we go to put on an, uh, an immodest outfit we're, we're used to wearing, we're like, 
I don't, I don't think I want to wear that. Or we go to watch some episode of a Netflix series we're, we're watching, and, and we're like, I don't think I'm going to watch the rest of that series um, because we have been changed. We, the, the supernatural life has become more intense for us, and correspondingly, the natural life is less attractive for us. Our spiritual senses are much more active than they were before. Or perhaps we, we go back to our trials and our tribulations, difficulties that we're facing on a regular basis, and we see them in a different light. We're much more capable of bearing with them. We're much more at peace in the fact that we have these trials in our lives. Perhaps as well, we feel a greater attraction towards attending Holy Mass or receiving Holy Communion or reading spiritual books. If we sense these things, and, and as I say, it's, it's so good, if we're able to pick this up, the movements of our soul, we are experiencing this um, awakening of our supernatural life, the intensification of our supernatural life. So my dear faithful, in the gospel today, see what our Lord does. He looks up to heaven, and then he may, has this deep sigh, um, and then he says to the man, be opened, open your senses. And this is what I'm saying to you today. Open your supernatural senses. You have a supernatural life and you need to bring in to your soul spiritual things, supernatural things. We are still telling the this, this story of, of Helen Keller today because it was such a wonderful thing what happened to her for her to be given this ability to speak we're we're still reading this gospel every year and wondering at the power of our lord you know how he's telling people don't tell anybody that i did this but they can't help themselves they're overjoyed that this has happened this disability this terrible disability has been removed from this man we too we must be um, so joyful to be given these supernatural sense to be given the divine life. We must want to exercise that divine life, stimulate the divine life, provide it to our children, and so accordingly expect to, to be able to rejoice in that life for all eternity. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.